So good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining this webinar promoted by the Espresso Project. My name is Mario Conci, and I work um, in, in the Espresso Project. Espresso Project is an Horizon 2020 project that aims to create a conceptual smart cities information framework based on open standards. The, the main goal of the, of the project is to ensure the interoperability of smart city solutions and uh, we want to help cities avoiding entry barriers or vendor locking. One of our activities in, in Espresso is also knowledge sharing and uh, these webinars are part of these of this activities. We have so far organized uh, nine webinars and uh, yeah, we, we want to share knowledge and best, best practices on the usage of open standards in smart cities. And particularly the webinar of today is organized together with uh, the Green Digital Charter that is an initiative promoted by EuroCities. Rebecca is going to tell us more about, about these initiatives uh, in, in, uh, in a while. And uh, yeah, the speakers of today are Daniel Saraza, Smart City Program Manager from City Council Saragossa, and Antonio Kung, CTO at Trialog. Um, as you know, the topic of today is data management and citizens' privacy in smart cities open governance. So before starting, uh, a few remarks. Uh, the webinar is recorded and it will be uploaded on this web Espresso website or on the digital uh, on the Green Digital Charter uh, uh, platform. And uh, uh, for the questions, so everyone is muted. We will collect the questions at the end and we would like you to use the, the questions box. So we would like to collect written questions. If you are more comfortable to ask, so to use your voice, uh, just raise your, your hand by using the, uh, the, the box provided close to your names. So um, we can start. Uh, I leave the floor to uh, Rebecca Portel who is going to tell us a little bit more about the Green Digital Charter Initiative. So, Rebecca, is it? So, um, hi everyone, thank you Mario, and uh, welcome all to this joint webinar on data management and privacy in smart cities. So, I'm Rebecca, I'm working for the Green Digital Charter, and to word about uh, this project, it is a EuroCities-led initiative gathering 52 European municipalities, all committed to use digital solutions to improve quality of life of their citizens. Um, it is supported by the Guidance Project, which supports the implementation of the Charter and monitors progress of its signatories. So you can follow our past and future activities on, on our website at www.greendigitalcharter.eu or by following uh, our Twitter account, uh, GDC uh, Charter. Uh, let me now introduce the, the first speaker, Daniel Sarasa. Uh, Daniel is working for a Smart City Program Manager for Saragossa City Council. Uh, Saragossa assigned the Green Digital Charter in 2011 and is a real success story when it comes to smart city and open data. In January of this year, uh, the Saragossa Citizen Card has been awarded Best GDC Project in terms of citizen engagement and impact on, on society. Uh, more information about all these case studies um, can be found uh, in our 2016 collection, available on our website. So Daniel is a co-author of uh, Saragossa's Open Government Strategy and uh, will now present uh, his guidelines for urban, urban big data sharing. Daniel, um, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rebecca. Uh, thank you, Mario. 
Um, well, um, as uh, Rebecca said, I'm, I'm working um, as a project manager in to the small city department of uh, Zaragoza, which is the fifth largest uh, city in Spain. Um, and uh, we set up this smart city department uh, in one of the uh, flagship, the city's flagship innovation hubs, which is Utopia Center for Arts and Technology. <clears throat> and this gives us not only the possibility to um, to launch uh, um, traditional um, smart city projects, but also to uh, get into uh, the smart city strategy, different profiles, artists, entrepreneurs, uh, civic agents, etc. I'm going to tell you a little bit uh, what we think about the use and benefits and, and management of, of big data in cities, what that big data means for us, but I'm going to, uh, to do it from a very from a point of view uh, from, from inside a city hall, a more organizational uh, point of view, challenges and opportunities. Uh, we're going to have, after my presentation, a more um, detailed uh, presentation about what uh, big data technically uh, can be effectively used to create value for cities. Um, but I'm going to focus, as I said, on the organizational uh, aspects and challenges. Now, um, just a little uh, remark about what big data means uh, for uh, for a city. Um, on the left, you can find uh, sorry, yeah. On the left, you can find the traditional processes and and meanings, famous four V's meanings of uh, big data. Uh, but we want to introduce uh, slightly different aspects when it comes to uh, what city halls, how city halls city halls can deal with big data, uh, the processes of asking the right questions, the processes of effectively learning from from um, from big data, um, the governance aspects, and how we can enhance somewhat uh, the feeling of citizenship with with big data. Um, we've come out with a slightly different definition about big data because you know volume, value, velocity, etc. That changes over time. Okay, um, and what is big data for an organization cannot be big data for another organization. In general, I would I would say that big data for us is, is the data whose handling or analysis sets the organization really out of its comfort zone. Okay, we, we don't know really, we, we know there is a lot of potential in it, but we don't know really what to do with that, especially the city halls where we don't have uh, data analytics uh, capabilities and we have to lean on different, on, on external agents. Now, um, what do we want to do with big data? Well, cities cities are a great invention, what, one of the biggest and greatest inventions of human, humanity. Uh, and they perform overall well. We, we are uh, tackling very big challenges with that, uh, climate change, uh, poverty, etc. But um, cities have bugs. The fact that we leave so many people together leads to uh, impracticalities in transportation, in pollution, uh, quality of life, inequality, etc. Um, so these impracticalities or bugs is what really uh, the smart city is about. It's fixing these um, these uh, little problems that we have, little big problems that we have in cities. And, and we have them in four areas, economy, quality of life, democracy, sustainability. Um, so the focus of your uh, city strategy is going to depend on the place of the earth your city is located or the time frame uh, where you live in. Um, now, for example, in Zaragoza, we're very, very uh, focused on on the economy. We, we, are, um, we have a high unemployment rate. Uh, we are also concerned about democratic uh, issues, for example. Um, now, how, how do we cities tackle with this with this in, in, in practicalities, or how how do we uh, face this challenge with innovation? Innovation is accelerating at a greater speed every time, uh, and we are uh, looking. And innovation is coming out from cities. It's coming out of cities. Cities are uh, they have people, and people have ideas. So um, we need to be we need to be able to put these ideas in motion, and you know, the uh, the data is the new the new source uh, of the of the economy after going through all these uh, sources before. Um, so, 
cities are somewhat trapped in an innovation spiral. We're competing against each other. We, we need to we need to innovate at a quicker pace every time uh, if we don't want to be uh, left behind. And one of the things that we can do is to uh, to think about uh, in this uh, smart city uh, implementation. Uh, who is playing this game? Um, in the past, well, the city halls, were, we were mostly responsible for everything that was happening in the city, every system. But now, uh, city operations is a distributed task. Um, of course, the city hall is accountable and responsible for that, but we have the utilities, the banks, the new internet giants, etc. And this leads to a very complex governance. And what happens is that many of these companies uh, they're based on their their business models are based on on big data. Of course, Google uh, business models is 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 based on big data. Many of these companies have invented and have patents that f are found in the big data the idea itself. And and it's a question of um, somehow um, keeping track of these changes um, um, from the city hall perspective and. And it's a battle between innovation and protectionism uh, because these companies that I'm showing here, they are somewhat disrupting our local our local markets, the taxi market, the uh, freight delivery market, etc., the rental uh, apartment rental market. Um, so we we need really to address the uh, the issue of big data very very carefully because we know that we can create a lot of value. With, with big data, cities we are sitting on a gold mine because these companies are using data from the people and the people are living in cities. So it's like the city holds, we're responsible um, for this, you know, uh, gold mine that is creating a lot of uh, value for the economy. Uh, and we, we're, we're being taught, okay, you should open your public data, and Zaragoza is one of the cities in, in Spain that is leading this way of, of opening data. But opening data can only create a certain amount of value into the overall economy. The rest of the of the value is um, leads leans in the in the private data. So we think from from a city perspective that we should all join forces and we should all uh, try to. Um, um, to open our data, not only not only the uh, public administrations, but all, but also the big corporations. Okay. Uh, now that does not mean that we are um, we, we need to protect, of course, the legitimate business assets. And this is it doesn't mean that we're going to open our databases, okay, to each other. So it's not only about sharing data. It's mostly about sharing the knowledge that this data is creating. Uh, for the benefit of uh, of the citizens, okay, of the producers of this data. Now, a practical example that we could that we could think about uh, was um, we have this citizen card. Rebecca uh, told you about it. is uh, is is a card. It's an RFID, very simple card that uh, leads to um, uh, most of the public services in the city, from transportation to sports, public libraries, Wi-Fi, parking. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. We, we have like 17 or 18 different services here. So if we could um, share this knowledge that we have with the citizen card, with the knowledge that uh, the banks have about tra economic transactions in the city, uh, the telecom operators, the utilities, the energy, the Twitter, I'm sure that we could um, uh, have. A lot of a lot of uh, issues solved in the uh, in the city. Real real urban challenges and real urban uh, problems. Now, um, of course, doing this is most easily said than done because to effectively to effectively do it, we need to tackle uh, many many things. For example, uh, privacy. Uh, you know. The Moore's law is uh, playing against us. Uh, the storage capacity of devices is doubling every two years, and this means that more uh, data about us uh, is being recorded. And you know this famous study about MIT, where if you if we're able to track four of your payments in a in a credit card, we um, we have 90% of possibilities. Uh, to be sure that it's you effectively using that card. Well, um, 
you know, we, we think that uh, we live in a world where we um, should uh, cope with privacy breaches. Uh, in, we are giving away our, our privacy uh, to buy uh, cheap plane tickets, um, a better uh, um, email service, etc. Um, and and there is an elegant there is an elegant uh, work uh, by Microsoft by a by a lady called Work uh, about differential privacy that says basically that if we want to set up these data sharing agreements between different databases, um, I mean there is going to be a privacy breach um, somewhere along the road. So um, but you could put some noise into the database and you could effectively choose uh, the amount of Accuracy that you want in your data, and the amount of protection that you that you that you want. So I I think this is a good uh, clue to follow. Uh, and there are other uh, projects and other cases where the user would give uh, their data uh, for scientific purposes, as for example, uh, people are doing in the project in Barcelona, smartcitizen.me, uh, or uh, people are willing to donate their data for a medical. Uh, for medical reasons, for example. Now, another guideline is that we need to implement uh, agreements uh, between the city hall and research institutions uh, to implement the feedback loop in which uh, we are able, as cities uh, or city hall, to effectively learn what big data is, uh, is trying to tell us. Um, Another thing that we need to, to, to create is good observatories. There is a nice example from, from Bristol, for example. They've turned their old data dome into, a, into an open data observatory. They lead uh, programs throughout uh, Britain with artists to help uh, companies and to help uh, institutions visualize and extract uh, the traits of, uh, of big data instead of producing complex reports that nobody understands. Um, something that similar uh, with what we do in, in the exploration of the universe. Uh, so the stars are better observed from the space and cities are better observed from, from cities. We need to create urban observatories. Um, as I said, this is the example of Bristol. Um, and next with the observatory, usually there is a laboratory, there is a lab uh, where we link citizens with artists, with entrepreneurs, um, with the uh, uh, city departments uh, to be able to extract this value of big data. Now, uh, let's talk a little bit about the questions and answers. Uh, You've heard about hackathons, uh, and data is uh, is is something um, that is always present in in, in hackathons. Uh, but some sometimes we do this process the other way around. We find uh, the uh, quest the answers before uh, having the right questions. So we what we propose is first. Uh, to do civic hackathons in which people that know how the city works and how, uh, what are the problems of the city without technology can put their ideas on the challenges and in the second phase is the, uh, the programmers, the people that dominate the technology uh, that provide solutions. So we need to match knowledge, uh, technical knowledge with um, city knowledge. Now, another important uh, thing to think about if we want to effectively share data between, between the city stakeholders is about cooperation. Cooperation is needed for this, but cooperation is a fragile uh, process. Um, and one of the biggest obstacles for this is the, uh, the, the silo effect and the data silos that we have in cities and between organizations. And we need to be uh, to tackle this, uh, we need to set up very, very uh, soft um, cooperation agreements uh, and governance uh, structures, and very flat uh, also, because uh, we, we want to set up this, this agreement into a cooperation dynamics, into the Nash equilibrium. This is the famous Nobel Prize, Steve Nash. Um, and the, the trick here is to be able to set 
the strategies of all players in this game, the bank, the telecom provider, the utilities, the city hall, etc., into a state of cooperation where the win-win situation is to, to, to effectively cooperate. And this can be done through a mix between regulation and incentives. Now the governance, the governance factor is very important and uh, so there are two possibilities here. Uh, um, a strict hierarchy, which is not possible in this case because, you know, as I said, the smart city is, is, uh, is the result of a very complex uh, governance system or to be able to set up uh, very flat organizational structures uh, where all the agents can be represented and, and we, we also uh, take care of even personal relations uh, between all the stakeholders. Um, we've done that in, in, in Ethiopia, or we're trying to do that. Um, and we, we're trying to set up this ecosystem of very, very uh, diverse uh, actors. Now, the cities uh, can add something to, to big data, is the connection with the, with the citizens. And for this, it's very important uh, to have artists on board, because artists can help us to um, to, to visualize what's behind of, of of big data, what what data really means about, or is trying to tell us about the functioning or the problems of our city. Uh, we're developing some programs with the with CERN in Switzerland, in which artists and scientists cooperate together uh, to um, find new radical. Um, ideas out of uh, out of the scientific projects and we're also taking advantage of our um, you can you can see that on the right hand side on the lower right uh, side of my presentation of the screen uh, where we use the digital facade of Utopia which is 600 square meter digital facade to uh, do artistic visualizations on on data now, another thing that we can do as cities is to lower the technological barrier uh, to the city uh, because uh, for non-technical uh, citizens, it's very hard uh, to participate on this project and they can have valuable ideas. So um, we, we are advocating for a, a, an API, an application programming interface to the smart city, which is human, you know, so a, a layer of mediators that can lower this barrier uh, in, to, to, to facilitate um, the connection of the ideas of the people with the smart city uh, projects. And of course we need to be open and think about new profiles, not only engineers and data scientists here, but we need data journalists, we need artists, we need uh, political scientists, I mean, we need a whole lot and many, many professions that were not even represented here. But we need really to be diverse in the in the types of profile that, that work for us. Now, uh, I'm going to finish now. Um, one just final remark. Uh, we need, I mean, big data is, a, is a telling us a, a, a futuristic dream. Uh, everything can be possible and we and we can think that we can aspire to have the perfect machine, the perfect smart city like a, like a machine. Uh, but I would warn you against data-driven government, which is a, a, a very sexy uh, thing, but can lead to, to, uh, to misunderstanding and can lead to, to problems. Um, so I think data can help to, ba to balance, uh, to put some objectivity into the otherwise uh, very subject decision-making process, but data should not replace uh, politics, media, uh, intuitive civic knowledge, etc. And of course, we need to be very careful uh, of the observer effect. You know, what, when something is measured, uh, the very measure changes uh, the result of the experiment. Uh, and finally, um, just uh, you know, this great. Uh, civic thinker uh, Jamie Lerner, uh, civics, cities are not the problem, they're the solution and many of the solutions in cities are going to come uh, through big data but we're going to need everyone else to make them happen. Uh, thank you very much.
So now, th thank you, Daniel. Now let's going to listen about Antonio Kung presentation. Please, Antonio. Good afternoon, everyone. Antonio Kung speaking. I hope you see my screen. Let me introduce myself. I'm Antonio Kung. I'm the CTO of a French company, Trialog. It's a French software house which focuses on IoT. And we're involved in uh, domains such as energy, mobility, health, care. I have an engineering background, so I'm not afraid to go into the details of technology background. You will see that. But I will also talk about other aspects. Okay. I'm very much involved in standardization for privacy. Um, I'm the editor of Privacy Engineering, ISO 27550. I'm involved in the new upcoming standards on security and privacy for big data, 2547 part 4. And I'm the reporter of Privacy in Smart Cities, a study period in ISO, and Privacy Guidelines in the IoT, another study period in ISO. Things are moving, I have to say. I'm also a member of an informal community called IPEN, the uh, Internet Privacy Engineering Network, which was launched by EDPS, uh, the European Data Supervisor. And uh, it's a, a community where we exchange ideas about how we do it. And uh, I'm uh, uh, editing a wiki called ipen.trilog.com where you have all the information about those standards. So you can go through it and uh, have a look of what's going on. Okay. I'm leading, uh, that's the reason why I'm part of this uh, webinar. I'm actually involved in EIP SCC. I'm leading the initiative called Citizen Approach to Data Privacy by Design. Okay. And this is because I was the coordinator of the Prepare Support Action and we made a commitment to EIP SCC. Prepare has published uh, some tools, some methodological tools to, to implement privacy and uh, uh, get uh, compliance with the GDPR. So I'm going to make a presentation taking a policymaker or a smart city uh, stakeholder viewpoint. Okay? And uh, the point is that uh, we've seen that uh, with uh, pre Daniel's presentation is that uh, we're dealing with very complex ecosystems. Okay? So smart cities, of course, touch us upon big data. That was actually the talk from Daniel, okay? But also it touches upon IoT, okay? But on top of this, we have domains, smart grids, health, transport, mobility, and so forth. And when we build those systems, uh, we have a number of concerns. So uh, we are going to focus today on privacy, but of course we have security uh, concern or cyber security concern, and of course safety concerns. You have those, those concerns which actually in a city uh, we have to deal with, okay? So it's a major undertaking and it's very complex. Um, but when it comes to privacy, we must take into account in Europe, at least, the GDPR, uh, which we have to follow on May 25th, 2018, okay? And this uh, uh, text uh, deals very clearly with a number of rules that uh, we have to deal with actually in, in, in smart cities, data controllers, data processes, data protection officers, we have to be nominated in all public authorities. And those DPOs, we have responsibilities. They cannot be junior people because they will be liable. Okay. And uh, all public authorities, we have to have a, such a DPO. Companies dealing with a large number of data subjects will also have to uh, uh, a, a DPO. Uh, the sanctions for breaches will be very high, so up to 20 million euro or 4% of the annual turnover. Um, the policymakers must therefore understand a number of terms. So we talk about privacy by design or PBD, you will see that. Okay? Privacy by design is actually uh, the, the fact that you institutionalize privacy management. So it's on, not only technical, but it's also and probably mainly organizational. Okay. And the second thing where actually is technical is that you have to integrate privacy concerns when you engineer the systems, okay? Another term is privacy by default, and this is uh, by default that you have to take the highest level of protection, okay? Which is actually, it's a bit confusing when you think about big data. Another term is PIA, or privacy impact assessment. There is an obligation to carry out what we call a privacy impact assessment. That is a process which evaluates the impact on privacy. I'll come back to that uh, with some more technical uh, explanation. Okay. Um, I'm using the terms privacy by design, privacy impact assessment, but the GDPR doesn't use those terms. It uses the term data protection by, by design, data protection impact assessment instead of privacy. But I will 
Of course, the, 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 the lawyer will make a difference, but I will not. Okay. So uh, when it comes to uh, the municipality stakeholders, this is the complex picture. Okay. So he has to start to, to deal with, on top, uh, the citizen. Okay. The citizen, uh, of course, is engaged. The citizen uh, has to provide consents and the citizen might have requests. Okay, what did you do with my data? And he might even complain, okay? Um, so he provides the consent to a data controller here, okay, which is a stakeholder operating a system. For instance, a big data operating uh, system, okay? And the data controller, we have to uh, comply with privacy regulation on the right, okay? Data controller might be complex, so he might actually deal with other uh, people in the chain. So what you call a data processor. Think about a, a bank. A bank could be is a data controller because it it it, it controls all your your financial data, your accounts, uh, what you put in, and so forth. Okay, and but the management of uh, the, the 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 account might be done by another company. So this would be a data processor. Okay. Um, those. Uh, Organization, we have to deal with suppliers because uh, they, they, they need suppliers to provide them the technology and the systems to work with, okay? So we have integrators and suppliers, okay? What would be the difference? Is actually the integrator is providing the global system and he knows about the purpose, so he's able to carry out privacy impact assessment and privacy by design. Now, the point is that the supplier, so for instance, you buy an operating system, you buy uh, a, a storage system, okay? Um, this is very generic, and so the requirements uh, are, will be provided by the other stakeholders, but the purpose will be unknown, okay? When we think about this, the municipality stakeholders must deal with this whole ecosystem, okay? So we have to deal with contracts, so he's providing contracts, please operate this application for me, okay? But since he has a privacy constraints, a regulation constraint, he has to have an understanding and a management of all the PIAs that uh, he is, uh, that are under his jurisdiction, okay? And he will have also all the agreements for data exchange that are under his jurisdiction. On top of this, he will have to uh, interact with the citizen to provide transparency, things like that. So managing privacy is complex for smart cities. Now, if you take the IoT uh, vision, I would say it's more or less a supply chain vision, okay? So, uh, in general, we, sh we show them as verticals. We call them verticals, okay? So, uh, we start from below uh, the things, okay, in the Internet of Things, so sensors, devices, but even a cloud solution is often considered a thing, okay? So, they are provided by suppliers. The purpose is unknown, okay? Although about the, uh, above this, you can build everything, okay? Then you have the integrator. He put them together, the purpose of which is known. And then you have the operators, okay? The operators, you can have many. It could be the same, but uh, actually operating several applications. For each of those applications, you need to have a privacy impact assessment, okay? And this is to be handled by the smart city officer. So he's not only dealing with one uh, privacy impact assessment, but actually uh, with uh, several. Now, if you take the big data ver vision, the, the, the vision is a little bit different, so I call it the sharing chain instead of the supply chain, okay? So we have data sets uh, which are made available and then which are transformed, okay? So uh, I'm, I have an initial version, I transform it, I'm doing data analytics and so forth, okay? So uh, here, we, we have a chain where we also have obligations. So we have what we call a data sharing agreement, okay? And those data sharing agreements, exactly the same thing, must be dealt with by the smart city officer. He must understand what's going on and he must uh, track that. So let's assume you have in the middle a, a data breach, okay, a privacy breach, okay. How do we deal with this, okay? You need to have the data sharing agreements to see where it came from and where you can fix that. So what are the concerns? Uh, uh, so I, I took again a vertical vision where we have uh, on the left the demand side from the policymaker down to the supplier, okay? Basically, from a privacy management point of view, we have the policymakers, the operators, and the supplier, okay? The operators are data controllers and data processors. They have all three concerns to deal with, okay? Uh, amongst others, but those are the three important ones for privacy. How do I ensure le legal compliance? 
how do I manage my privacy, how I, do I build a system which is compliant, okay? So uh, when it comes to the legal compliance, it's GDPR in Europe, okay? Uh, when it comes to management concern, we want people to, uh, pr to provide the evidence that it's done properly, so we have PIAs and sharing agreements. And when it comes to the system uh, building, we need to show that we do privacy by design, okay? Um, the policymaker is not doing that himself, he's just wanting to have a compliance check and he wants to make sure that everything is transparent because he will be accountable with respect to the citizens, okay? The operators and, uh, will, will just perform the things uh, that actually are in the GDPR and the suppliers will also, if the requirements are properly uh, stated, okay? So if the requirements are, are, are not done properly, then it could be that the supplier doesn't do a great job, okay? So you see that the whole chain uh, must follow the constraints of privacy. Now, I want to show a little bit what is a privacy impact assessment, okay? It basically, it's a risk assessment. So uh, when you start, uh, you, you start to identify what are the pro potential privacy breaches, okay? One example could be uh, you have a banking account and uh, then uh, someone knows about what you, you are uh, uh, doing in your banking account, okay? So you're transferring money, you're asking, buying things and things like that. And somehow it gets known to the public. This is a privacy breach, okay? So what are the, the, source, the risk sources which would create this privacy breach? For instance, you could have a, a vulnerable system. So someone is hacking into the banking system, okay? the IT system, and then uh, getting out of it uh, the data and publish it, putting it on the web. This is a threat. But another source is the, the data processing. So actually, it could be that the bank is providing information to an insurance company, okay? So uh, this, is, this could be a privacy breach unless consent was given, okay? But another privacy breach is uh, your uh, employee that is uh, dealing with your account just mention, uh, look at your account and tell to another people, okay? This is a privacy breach. So you can see the privacy breach is not only technical, it can be very much organizational. So some human can uh, be, uh, behave in such a way that you have a privacy breach, okay? So what are the consequences you have on the right? The impact on citizen privacy, of course. So this is the thing we have to deal with, okay? And then you also have the impact on an organization, okay? because uh, it could show that the, the organization is not well protected. It can show that the organization is actually uh, uh, not very rigorous on its handling, and it could, it could have an impact on its reputation, okay? So um, <clears throat> actually, when, when we, 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 we consider the whole thing, I have to say that the focus on privacy mainly comes from the thing on top. Uh, so focus on private personal data processing, and uh, the PIA is about the citizen privacy. Okay. Of course, in an organization, you will deal with other parts because you also want the system to be secure. You want to check that uh, it doesn't jeopardize your own business, okay? Once you have done that, so this is only for one privacy breach. You have to do it for all the privacy breaches that you can identify. Then you identify measures, okay? And the measures are, again, organizational and technical. So both, if you only deal with that one, uh, you lose you lose the thing. It's not it's not a p p proper privacy impact assessment. So this is what is required for for by the GDPR and in general for privacy management. Now privacy by design uh, is now more much more associated with the the building of a system. So below we have the life cycle and we build the system. So when we start on the left, we, we only have privacy principles. Okay, then uh, we analyze the system. And uh, we take into account the privacy principle and we comment with the privacy requirements, okay? Once we have the privacy requirements, we will design the protection aspect, which we often call privacy controls, okay? Sometimes we call, also call them privacy enhancing technologies or PETs, okay? Uh, it's just that I personally prefer to use the term privacy control because in PET you have the T word, which means that actually it's technical. But you know, sometimes it's not only technical because it could be an architecture uh, vision, okay? For instance, you could have a decision that uh, when a car is collecting data, the, the data is always kept forever in the car, not in the cloud, okay? And this is an architecture decision that obviously has some benefits in terms of PIA, or of, uh, of, of privacy, sorry. So now the PIA 
uh, is a risk assessment that is done along the life cycle process. So it, it is iteration based because you start here when you do analysis, you find a solution and you iterate. This is very important. This is the link between the PIA uh, and the, the, the privacy by design. I want to show to you uh, what has been done in one example, that's the Sharing Cities, that's the H2020 project. Okay. Um, so you have the, the, the website here. It's uh, one of the, those big uh, smart city projects uh, which uh, um, uh, involves the city of London, Milan, Lisbon as the lighthouse uh, uh, cities and um, uh, Bordeaux, Burgas and Warsaw as followers. Okay? So we started a program and I was involved in helping them. Uh, I had a workshop in March, a two-day workshop where uh, we checked the, the case of the cities of London, Milan and Lisbon. Okay? One thing that is very important I must highlight is that in those workshops, you cannot just put junior people. You have to put the DPO there because he has to understand what's going on. It's strategic. Okay? That's what they did. Okay? We'll have another workshop in June where we'll work on more details. And uh, we are in a learning phase. So uh, what the, the goal is to learn how to apply effectively a management plan for GDPR compliance. Okay? So what are the next steps uh, for, uh, to, to me on, on this kind of uh, thinking? Uh, so it's, of course, getting into some common work on privacy management. Okay? So we need to have guidelines. And those are items, it's just an example, items that uh, we have identified during the workshop. Okay? So we need to come up with a privacy management plan where uh, we define what is the governance scheme or who is deciding, okay? who is deciding, who is uh, uh, in charge, the role and duties, and the, the resources, and uh, so sorry here, you see start, it should be staff. Okay, I type it too, too, too fast. So resources and staff. So how many people do you put there? Who are in charge and things like that, okay? Then you have to decide about the management. So we have a repository of PIAs and data sharing agreements. Okay, how do we ma manage that? We have to interact with the citizens. So do we have a dashboard, okay? Uh, how do we lodge complaints? How would you handle that, okay? What about breach management? Do we have a staff uh, to handle that when we have breach management? Technical staff to restore and also a PR staff to, uh, of course, uh, to deal with the citizens, okay? And of course, continuous improvements. And the guidelines should be, of course, helpful, so it must include templates for PIAs, data sharing agreement, privacy notice template, and also guides for suppliers. Last slide. So, what about standardization? Okay, standardization is totally new. We have not much, uh, not many things. So, on on the on the left here, you have uh, the current work. Okay, so uh, you have something called privacy framework. Basically, it mentions the principles. You have the PIA. Yes, it's there. It's it's actually it's not uh, uh, available yet, but probably this year it will be accessible. We check the privacy impact assessment, privacy engineering. This is new. So that, that's myself. It's going to be available maybe uh, in one year and a half. Code of practice is more some help. And you have for management the P, what we often call PIMPS, Privacy Information Management System. This is new, okay? So uh, it's going to be available uh, maybe next year. Now, there's nothing about uh, IoT, but my guess is that it must be supply chain oriented. There's nearly nothing about uh, big data. There's one thing ongoing, but my, it's, it's in progress. But my guess is it has to be sharing chain oriented. And finally, uh, for smart cities, I, I really think that it must be management oriented. And uh, we are trying to define uh, the objectives of such standards right now. Thank you. So I'm done, uh, Mario. Yeah. Th th thank you, Antonio, for your presentation. <clears throat> so now let's open the floor for questions. I, I haven't received any, any written questions. Uh, is there someone that w would like to, to say something or to ask something to our, to our speakers? You can, as said, you can use the, the written way, so using the questions box or raise your hand. So just check in the box close to your name.
Okay, we have a raised hand from Magnus Josephson. Please, Magnus. Yes, thank you, and thank you very, thank you both for for, for very good presentations. I suppose I suppose the question is more for 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 Daniel, but there seems to be a, a, a fundamental tension between. You know this idea of of, uh, of of the use of big data, and then the new GDPR, which essentially um, aims to curtail the, the use of <laughs> of data. So um, I, I'd value your thoughts on that. Thank you. The, the question was for. Daniel, you said? Oh. Yes. So Daniel? Okay. Daniel? Yes, I had okay. my mic uh, <laughs> muted. Okay, uh, hi Magnus. Uh, so yeah, of course there is, there is, this, there is this tension. Um, my, my thoughts on that is um, um, a way, a way forward um, would be maybe not to focus on on, on sharing data, uh, but to to uh, focus more on sharing knowledge. Okay, um, so we need we don't need to interconnect databases. We know what that means and what that can. And if we connect databases, I mean, uh, we enter into a completely different and unknown. Uh, path of, of problems and so so maybe it's better to establish the agreement in terms of sharing knowledge okay so what for example what uber knows about the traffic in the city uh, what does uh, telefonica or uh, vodafone knows about uh, you know mobility or what does a bank knows about uh, the financial prob the uh, economical economic problems in a certain neighborhood or uh, can we you know and if, if we can effectively find mechanisms to share this knowledge um, and and then each of these actors can work on their on their own databases uh, extracting value and putting this value in the table and maybe we could link this knowledge together and create new new solutions and have new insights into what's happening in the city. Can I add something, Antonio speaking? So uh, I'm working several projects on big data and uh, I see uh, two trends that are trying to solve that. Okay, The first one is very well known, is open data. So uh, by default, uh, you create something that normally is anonymous. So uh, you do you have to do anonymization. At the end, uh, of course, when you combine data, you may you must have the risk of re-identification. Okay, so this is basically the risk you have to solve. And if there is a re-identification risk, you have you have to come back to the way the open data was built up and uh, uh, change it. Okay, so this is the first answer. And I think open data is bo booming and it will it will, it, will, it will explode. I'm pretty sure. Okay. The second thing is what we call personal data ecosystems. So that actually, if I have a car, I'm going to collect data. My data is my data. So it's going to be made available maybe in the cloud, but only I have access. Okay, And I will somehow sell or make available my data for big data. So if uh, exactly what Daniel said, if to get this knowledge, you need to access it, then there is a kind of negotiation. Can I access your data in such a way that I get information on this knowledge? Okay? And I think this is a second trend, the personal data ecosystem trend, where actually everything, but everything, is handled by the user. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Th thank you, Antonio. And there are other two questions for Daniel. Um, Daniel, can, can, can you read it? I mean, I forwarded you. I don't know if you can read it on your screen, or if, if not... Okay. Yeah, let me check. Let me check. You you should see them. Yeah, hold on. Okay. So, what exactly your city is doing with tools and feedback loop for citizen engagement? Okay, from Long Pam. Um, all right. Um, so, um, 
I think the easiest way to visualize this is um, we have set up what we call uh, the R&D uh, lab of the city. It's called the Open Urban Lab. Um, and we're launching a set of new initiatives uh, from, this, from this lab. This is what we call the application program, the human happy uh, to the smart city. For example, we have the program uh, coming out of this lab. It's called 100 Ideas for Zaragoza. Okay, so the goal is to put 100 ideas, bottom-up ideas, in motion in the following years. Um, we implement this uh, notion of first doing civic hackathons, first asking the right questions, and then doing techie hackathons, matching questions with technological answers. Um, what would also in the innovation activities that we do, we tend to think about the smart city services without technology. We think that approach is very useful. So let's think um, about new public services, innovative public services without technology. If they work in terms of process without technology, if we put, if we add some technology, it booms, it flourishes, okay? Because we as engineers tend to put the technology first and try to adapt the service, the process, the, the outcome to the technology that we already had in mind. You know, that is some something very common with us uh, between the engineers. So um, and and putting out the technology out of the out of the process lowers these barriers. So citizens come up. And and another very important notion is the notion of open source. Open source projects and an open source city should be accessible. And accessible not only means uh, the, the right to know how the code is written, but also that the technology is not a barrier to know how the city works. Um, OK, that was the first question. Uh, the other question from Anna Melchor uh, is, um, what other activities different from hackathons have Saragossa organized to connect public administration and the other city organizations. Okay. Uh, okay, for example, we organize uh, what we call recreating the citizen card. Uh, recreating the citizen card is a program that we run with the University of Zaragoza uh, with the students uh, in the Master of Design. And the students come to Utopia Center for Arts and Technology uh, to um, do design thinking dynamics uh, and redesign and add new services on our uh, citizen card. And uh, for example, one of these one of these services that they uh, came up uh, with is called um, Share Zaragoza, and it's about um, being able to send a piece of your citizen card with a mobile app uh, to a visitor, for example. So I can send you a theater ticket, I can send you uh, a bus ticket to your, uh, to your uh, iPhone, even if you don't have a citizen card and you're not uh, a citizen of, of Zaragoza. And we're launching this, this project as, a, as one of the challenges that are um, Programmers in the ha in the in the hackathon uh, needs to uh, needs to solve. This is one of the examples. We have some others. Okay, thank you, thank you, Daniel. I have a final question for Antonio, and it is about the data protection officer. So, can you can you tell us a little bit more about what procedure to follow to hire a DPO and uh, what, what skills does this person need to have? What, what are his tasks? It's, I would say it's a little bit beyond my knowledge because it's lawyer oriented. Most uh, DPOs mm -hmm. are lawyers, but I can tell you my experience is that uh, when mm -hmm. discussed uh, currently with the cities, uh, you, you will have uh, some, in general, some legal oriented people who, who understand very well the GDPR, probably better than I do, okay? And uh, uh, they uh, are either advisor or uh, they are not uh, so, in general, not so high level. But at some point, when you have a PIA, you have to sign it off, okay? 
and uh, the signing off uh, must be done by someone that is responsible. It's like signing a contract, right? So uh, every city we have to understand this. And generally, I would say it has to be an experienced speak guy uh, that we understand fully the the privacy uh, legislation, and has been uh, let's say uh, very much in contact with the technical people. Okay. Uh, it's very rare, it's you know, nearly impossible to have someone that has both uh, degree or both understanding. As in general, uh, as those who exist, they serve as a consultant to, uh, to help. Okay? So uh, it's, I was told uh, we, we're going to hire like 50,000 DPOs in the next two years. Okay? So it, it's uh, uh, employment rate zero, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, we have a very last question uh, from Long Farm, again for Antonio. Do citizens have to identify their real identities when they participate in public forums at city level? What do you think of this regulation? Yeah. Okay, so I'm uh, not sure what uh, the question is, uh, is referring to something special, but I would say that it should never be the case that a citizen will have to reveal his name. Okay, What we really want to have is uh, having a proof that the citizen is part of uh, the community and things like that, or you're entitled to do things. But we have so many technologies available now to ensure that actually it's done in a kind of anonymous way. Okay, So I would say the answer is no, so you never it would be an infringement on privacy, by the way. So. Okay, so let's collect the last question from Sepe for Daniel. Uh, okay. Sepe from the, from the city of Ghent. Um, so an important question concerning the citizen's card. The processing of the personal data coming from the citizen card is obviously based on consent. How can a city create trust so that the citizens agree to share their personal data in the public interest? Okay. Did you uh, this, yes, this is a very good question. Um, because surprisingly, we have no problems as citizens in giving away our data to companies that exist in Silicon Valley. and. Um, and it's very difficult to 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 have a rights of access cancel notification etc with this data or even go to court with this with this company with these companies but we have more uh, psychological problems in giving away our data for uh, to our uh, local administration which uh, I mean is the closest administration uh, for us we can we can go to the um, to speak directly to the public servant if we want that is responsible for data management and and we could I mean it's very close relationship um, but this happens and and the criticism we've we've uh, received in the first uh, uh, years of our citizen card deployment is about this is about oh I don't want my city hall being my big brother and know everything that I do but so um, well, I'm sure that many people uh, didn't find that the services that we were um, uh, offering in the new citizen card were uh, worth the cost of giving away their data. So they didn't choose the citizen card. But most of the people, most of the people in the city, they found them, they found them interesting enough. Um, so, but we're not sharing the data. We're not doing that. We're just keeping the data for our operational purposes, and we're just uh, using the data internally. Okay, uh, we want to uh, to do one more step in the development of our citizen card. We want to create the anonymous card. Okay, so everyone can have this card. Tourists, even if they're not registered in the city, or for people that don't want to give away their data. Okay, and. Even with the anonymous card, I'm sure that we're going to be able to create a lot of value in terms of um, knowing how the city really works. And with the anonymous card, we're going to have, I'm not going to say we wouldn't have to face the problem of privacy issues, but we will have less uh, problems with privacy issues because, you know, 
the card would just have an ID. There would no, there would be no personal link with, uh, with no link with personal data with that. Okay. Thank you, Daniel, for the answers. Thank you, Antonio. Thank you, Rebecca, for organizing with me this uh, this webinar. Thank you to the Green Digital Charter, and thank you, everyone. For, for joining the, the webinar. As said, we recorded it and we are going to upload it on the Espresso website. So you can find it on our webpage, espresso-project.eu. And uh, stay tuned for, for the next one. So thank you and have a nice day. Thank you.